A week is a long time in politics, but it seems like a lifetime in Formula One. Last Sunday, Ron Dennis, the hero, celebrating McLaren's 1-2 at Monza. Four days later in Paris, the guillotine comes down on McLaren's Constructors' Championship. They're judged to have cheated, they're hit with a $100 million fine, and their much-prized integrity is challenged. I've known Ron 40 years. very difficult for me when somebody I've known 40 years looks me in the eye and says, Max, I'm telling the truth with complete sincerity, and uh, you believe him. I just want to be very clear that at no stage did I ever say any lie to anybody. I put my integrity above everything, above this sport, and certainly above Formula One. A line is drawn, a truce is called, but no warm glow returns. Until we remind ourselves that we're back at Spa, where great Grand Prix reputations are made. Kimi Raikkonen has won here twice, but yesterday took his first pole position at the Belgian Grand Prix. Lewis Hamilton qualifies fourth, but still has a great chance of defending his world title lead. Alonso is also on road two, but was it the world champion who triggered this whole crisis for McLaren? Spa will echo again to the roar of Formula One engines and the buzz of a feverish Formula One paddock. There'll be plenty of both in our build-up to this Belgian Grand Prix. Welcome to one of the great circuits in Grand Prix motor racing. The Formula One World Championship returns to Spa after an absence of a year. But Mark, with everything that's been going on in the paddock uh, this week, we haven't really had a chance to enjoy these kind of sounds or these surroundings. But what does it mean to Formula One to be back here at Spa? It's fantastic to be back at Spa. Every Grand Prix driver loves this circuit. I guarantee 99.9% .9 would say it's the number one track in the world. Fantastic place to be. Luckily as well, it's not rainy because that's the normal circuit circumstance for us in Spa. And you're hearing the defiant tones of McLaren behind us now. Uh, what is their reputation and their task here this weekend, do you feel? Again, because of everything that's gone over the last week or so, I think they want to go back out and prove to the world that they're still number one and they've still got the driver championship to go for. Constructors out the window, but it's definitely going to be the driver championship was going to be the ultimate aim for them. OK, then, race prospects coming up in a few minutes' time. It's politics, I'm afraid, first of all. And on Thursday in Paris, the World Motorsports Council excluded McLaren from the Constructors' Championship and also hit them with that 100 million. But they didn't touch the points of the two McLaren drivers, Fernando Alonso and Lewis Hamilton. So we're still left with this prospect of Hamilton against Alonso and also Kimi Raikkonen in the battle for the title over the last four races, with Britain's Hamilton leading the championship by three points as he chases the title in his fabulous rookie season. But well, McLaren had been leading the Constructors' Championship by 23 points after their 1-2 in Monza, but they're out, disqualified and prevented from scoring any further points this season. Ferrari are effectively champions. The rulemakers have decided that one, and as Ted Kravitz reports, the FIA and the World Council were really flexing their muscles in Paris on Thursday. What's your feelings today? You feeling confident? The truth is, Ron Dennis hasn't felt confident for some time, both about who knew what in his own organisation or what penalty the FIA would impose. McLaren were called before the World Council in the first place to answer charges that they'd used Ferrari's technical secrets to make their own car go faster. The FIA found that they had. It's now become clear what was going on. Ferrari's Nigel Stepney was leaking all sorts of information to his old friend, the McLaren chief designer, Mike Coughlin. Both were disaffected with their jobs. Coughlin would glean information on the Ferrari and then pass it on in emails to McLaren's Pedro de la Rosa, who himself drove for Coughlin when both were at Arrows. It wasn't exactly cloak and dagger stuff. Things like, do you know the red car's weight distribution, Pedro asked. But it's phrases like, it's important for us to know so we can try it in the simulator that suggests McLaren got some competitive advantage out of it. De La Rosa kept Fernando Alonso in the loop as to who was leaking the Ferrari secrets. Indeed, when discussing what gas to inflate the tyres with, Alonso himself stressed that McLaren should use what they learned from Ferrari. Quote, it may be the key. Let's hope we can test it during this test. Now, it's this kind of technical chatter that's common between F1 teams and drivers. You can't stop old friends talking. But for Alonso and De La Rosa, to put it into writing is breathtaking in its naivety. But perhaps the most explosive thing we've learned this weekend is that it was Ron Dennis himself who tipped off the FIA as to the existence of Alonso and De La Rosa's emails, an honest confession that's ended up costing him £50 million and a Constructors' Championship. Ron was made aware of the email's existence during an argument with Alonso in Hungary following the infamous pit lane hold-up with Lewis Hamilton. McLaren will continue to support both Alonso and Hamilton's efforts in the Drivers' Championship but it's clear the relationship between Ron Dennis and Fernando Alonso is now at an all-time low.
So what then is your verdict, Mark? Have the FIA got it right, or could it have been a whole lot worse for McLaren? It's very difficult, Steve. You know, there's so many personnel changes throughout the season and over the seasons, and they all take little bits and pieces from the previous team. Even as a driver, I've left teams and I've taken information across to the next team. It goes on all the time. I just don't see that, you know, the, the punishment fits the crime here. Just $100 million, ludicrous figure. But there again, if the FIA feel that that's what, you know, the right thing to do, so be it. There's nobody above them to say anything different. Well, in the moment, we've got the thoughts of the McLaren boss, Ron Dennis, on everything that's happened to his team this past week. But yesterday afternoon in the paddock, we had some very forthright views indeed from the president of the FIA, Max Mosley. It was only when I got the list from the Italian police, 323, I think, SMS phone calls going over a three-month period between Cochrane and Stepney. I realized there has to be more to this. That wasn't, don't get 300 messages arranging a visit to Honda. This is something serious. I think we've demonstrated that we won't tolerate this sort of conduct, and they very nearly were out of business, very nearly. And the other teams fully understand that nobody should do this. And at the same time, the other teams, I think, are actually relieved to know that we will stamp it out. Once you get this culture of cheating in a sport, it's a complete disaster, and you've got to cut it out as soon as you find it. I'm just trying to run a fair, proper sport and make sure there isn't cheating as far as I, I'm able. And it's the World Council of the same. And it really, uh, something like this is very difficult because a team like McLaren can hire the best lawyers you can get your hands on, unlimited budget. They come in with literally tons of paper. Now, I'm responsible to the other teams. We're the people who are supposed to make sure that it's all fair and properly run. So uh, I think what we did actually was probably less than, arguably less than we should have done, but it's, there was the majority view on the World Council. That $100 million is less than the difference between his budget and that of Frank Williams or Renault and several other teams. So it's a very minor punishment as such. And they were extremely lucky that we didn't quite simply say, you have polluted the championship in 2007. You've probably polluted it in 2008 because we've no way of knowing what information you're using for what in your 2007, 2008 cars. So you better stay out of the championship until 2009 if you're still around because that way we know it's completely fair. We didn't do that and I think when history gets to be written of this, that may be what we will be reproached with. Not we're doing too much, but we're doing too little. Well, a couple of hours later came a qualification. Some would see it as a retraction of some of Max Mosley's comments, to the extent that he and Ron Dennis were able to declare an uneasy truce for the last few weeks have certainly taken their toll on Ron Dennis and his team. So what exactly is his relationship now with Max Mosley? Well, you can imagine it's strained because he is the uh, president of the FIA and uh, the FIA have been, um, you know, very diligent and... Uh, uh, transparent in trying to get to the bottom of uh, what is a, 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 a situation which I just could never believe that McLaren would find itself in. You know, the uh, the way that the thing has unfolded has just been a sort of living, almost living horror story. You know, I can't hide from the fact that you know I have had some, uh, primarily one individual and some drivers and some, you know other peripheral contacts, you know, that have done things which are just not correct. Nothing is perfect and no one is perfect. So, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that if, uh, if there are being criticisms levied at us, then, you know, then I've got to address those criticisms. But um, we're a great racing team. We know what it is to win. We've got, I don't think anyone's questioning the legality of our cars. Uh, otherwise, I don't think we'd be racing. There's been criticism levelled also at Fernando Alonso in the wake of what might or might not have happened on that Hungarian Grand Prix weekend. What's the relationship actually like now between the two of you? And what's the kind of respect that you have for, for Fernando? I uh, have a, a, a personal commitment which is ingrained in the team uh, to a quality. And um, it doesn't really matter as hard as it's hard as it is to comprehend uh, if a driver in his, is driving one of our cars he is going to get a quality in any set of circumstances and the team knows very well that actually whatever their emotions about or likes or dislikes about any of our drivers what comes before is the principle to equality yes my relationship with Fernando is strained uh, yes you know, he was 
as I was very much involved in in uh, going to the FIA. You know, I I made the call. I encouraged in in all of our drivers and uh, the people involved in this. You know, I I encouraged transparency and disclosure. You can't hide from the truth. I think the important thing is when the truth comes out, it's just to take as a balanced view on it. I want closure because I think this is the right thing for Formula One. Formula One's important to me. And uh, if I've damaged it, I most certainly have a very, uh, a very honest responsibility to try and contribute to repairing it. And I think probably closure is the right way to go. I, if I can address the, let's say, the loose ends of this affair and make quite sure that closure is closure, then my recommendation to my shareholders and my key partners is to uh, uh, not to appeal and move on. So the team here committed to getting through it, probably no appeal, but they're left with a fair bit of debris, not least Ron Dennis's relationship with Fernando Alonso. How do you see Alonso's role in all of this? Oh, it's going to be very difficult for Alonso up until the end of the season. Everybody here knows within the team that he's been part and parcel of this whole situation. It's still, you know, it's difficult for me to understand as a driver, a former driver, that you would get that deeply involved in the politics and actually, uh, to a point, try and hold the team to ransom. I don't think it would have worked, and uh, it certainly hasn't worked in my eyes. I mean, Ron Dennis has put a cap on it, and they've got on with it. But whatever goes on, Steve, nobody's bigger than the sport. Everyone has to remember that, and I think Formula One's got to get on and improve itself. OK, we will return to this topic shortly, in particular with an examination of McLaren's finances and how well-equipped they are, in fact, to cope with a $100 million fine. We'll be hearing from... Lewis Hamilton as well. But first, let's celebrate the fact that Formula One has returned to this great circuit of Spa after an absence of a year. The glorious Ardennes countryside south of Liège, that hasn't changed, but as Louise Goodman reports, there are some significant changes to this great Grand Prix venue. Spa-Francorchamps first hosted a Grand Prix back in 1924. The track has evolved over the years, but the fabulously fast circuit was still a public road until 2000. Overtaking's a regular feature. Michael's having to defend. Can he do Wait. it? Yes, he's done it. A brilliant move there. The Arden weather is almost as unpredictable as the racing, and it's created some unique winners and equally unique Grand Prix. Oh, this is quite appalling. This is the worst start for a Grand Prix that I have ever seen in the whole of my life. There were some big, big chunks there, and that's something that goes part and parcel with Spa because of the changeable weather. The infamous Eau Rouge corner used to be impossible to take flat out, although many drivers tried. Oh, that's a terrible crash. To keep up with the trend for modern day standards and facilities, Spa had to evolve in order to stay on the Formula One calendar. A major rethink was in order. £12 million worth of renovations saw the introduction of a modern media centre and, of course, more all important VIP areas. Plus, a new pit lane and matching grandstand. It's a popular race with die-hard fans and a favourite in the paddock as the teams get ready for action just a few days after Monza. Spa is a classic, a driver's favourite, and the new layout hasn't dampened their enthusiasm. It's not really changed much. Uh, they widened the exit of the first corner, uh, which is just better for the start in case there's a bit of an incident after the corner or something, more space to avoid. You still having the, the compression and the feeling in all rush uh, as you had always. But you know the difference is that a couple of years ago you have to lift in no rush, you have to, to risk in that corner. Now it's not anymore a risk because uh, it's flat out with with no big problems. There is one big problem with the new track though, the universally disliked pit lane entrance. The pit lane entrance is uh, which is some looks the most easier things to do it was the most difficult thing so it's, it's a, it was a very uh, strange way they did and uh, for sure is a negative it's so tight that there might actually be an incident going in there because someone's going to be too aggressive and and, uh, and crash and so it's not great 
think every driver feels the same. Um, it's going to be pretty scary in the race because it's so, so narrow. So the Queen of Tracks is back for 2007 and with a new facelift, she's looking better than ever. So how would the drivers cope with the challenge of what I suppose we have to call the new Spa? And how would McLaren and Ferrari be separated in yesterday's qualifying? Here's James Allen with the story of all yesterday's action. Kimi Raikkonen has won this race twice, but he's never been on pole before. All weekend, though, the Finn has been the man to beat that long wheelbase Ferrari, giving great stability in the medium and fast corners. It's a tough track on engines, and both Giancarlo Fisichella and Robert Kubica had to change their engines and take a big penalty. Lots of cars move up two places as a result. In the final runs, Massa had the edge over Alonso. Hamilton seemed to have opted for a different strategy. He's got more fuel. He settled for fourth place. Massa made a small mistake in the final chicane, and that allowed Raikkonen to snatch the pole. Amazingly, it's the first all-Ferrari front row of the year. It's always nice to be on pole. At least you know that you have a speed, but uh, the race is a different story. But I think so, we, we should have a good, good package for the race. I think starting first and second is great for the team. And uh, I think I have also a good opportunity to fight for even for a victory. We made a lot of improvements in the car and a lot of develops. So I think, uh, you know, we're still confident that tomorrow in the race we can we can have a chance. It's actually probably best not to be pole um, because you'll get someone will tow you into the up until turn five. So it's not that bad a position. Um, maybe try and get a couple of places at the at the first corner and then try to get another one after that. We we'll just have to wait and see what we can do. But I'll do the best job I can. So let's take a look at the grid. Third pole position of the season for Kimi Raikkonen and the first all-Ferrari front row of the year. Massa alongside, just a fraction behind his teammate. Alonso's never won this season from third place. Hamilton, first time he's been on the second row since Barcelona. Rosberg, outstanding in the Williams, has Heidfeld alongside him. It's Weber and Trulli making up row four. Row five, Kovalainen again in front of Fisichella, Ralph Schumacher in the Toyota. Coulthard and Jensen Button, two Brits on row six. On row seven, Tony Oliuzzi and Robert Kubica, who had to take a 10-place drop for an engine change. Wurtz and Vettel make up row eight. Row nine, Barrichello once again behind Button and Takuma Sato. Sutil and Davidson, his worst of the year in 20th. Yamamoto is 21st and Fisichella had an engine change after qualifying, he's 22nd. Mark, how impressed were you with the pace of the Ferraris yesterday? Uh, very impressed indeed. Very impressed at Kimi Raikkonen. I mean, the guy looked like he was driving it because he'd nicked it. I mean, he was that quick on the race circuit. I think Kimi is really comfortable with Ferrari now. He's comfortable with the car. And they look impressive because they've got consistency. Four or five lap runs they were doing, outperforming the McLarens uh, by a long shot. But let's wait and see. I think these guys still may be a little bit heavier with the silver cars. Lewis there suggesting that maybe pole position here isn't that important. But what do you feel Lewis can do off row two? No, pole position is always important, Steve. Leading into turn one, especially here with that hairpin, it's tricky to get round full stop. But he's always been a little bit slow the last few Grand Prix off to start. But then he's made amends going into the first turn. Maybe he can do it again here. Well, certainly, Kimi Raikkonen was outstanding yesterday. He dominated qualifying right through the contest. And here's the lap described by Martin Brundle that put him on pole position. Let's take a look at this spectacular spa francorchamps race circuit for today's Grand Prix. 4.6 miles through the valleys and trees, lots of undulation and great challenges lay ahead for the drivers. Let's take a look at pole position lap with Kimi Raikkonen in the front. Pop out over the top in Lecoum, and you're still accelerating. Climbing gently uphill too. 210 miles an hour, Lecoum chicane ahead of us. Break 100 meters before the corner. Bring it down to 90 miles an hour. Flick right, flick left. Get ready for Malmody, another 100 mile an hour corner that just tightens slightly through the exit. The car accelerates down to Rivage. Just keep it to the inside as long as you possibly can. Pick up the throttle as soon as you can. Now you're just streaming down the hill. 150 miles an hour in the middle of this straight. 180 before you sight the turn into Puon. Incredible speed on the way in. Just correcting the Ferrari mid corner. Now plenty of space to let it accelerate after 180 miles an hour before the Fania chicane. 90 through here, look at the way the car just changes direction, it's so stable and settled. Flick left for the first part of Stavolo, 95 through the apex, running very wide on the curb. Stavolo 2, easily full throttle, you're now into another 20 seconds. The exhilaration of Spa as demonstrated yesterday by Kimi Raikkonen. 
And of course, Ferrari now virtually guaranteed the Constructors' Championship title after the exclusion of McLaren in Paris on Thursday. And the other big decision, the other big penalty uh, that McLaren got hit with on Thursday was that $100 million fine. Now, how does any organization, let alone a sports team, absorb a financial hit like that? Well, here's a closer look at the finances of McLaren. Being handed the largest fine in motorsport history is a dubious honour, but it's something Ron Dennis will have to sort out. $100 million, £50 million would fund a year's racing for a small team like Spiker, but the sharp end of the grid attracts and retains big money, so the truth is, the top teams do have access to this kind of cash. £50 million was the headline figure, but the final total is minus the prize money McLaren would have received from Bernie Eccleston, which is about £35 million. So the balance to be paid by McLaren to the FIA will be in the region of £15 million. Well, these are McLaren's inputs. They get over £75 million in sponsorship, half of which comes from their title sponsor. Mercedes-Benz put in a further £125 million. That's the value of their supply of free engines for a year. Plus technical partners such as tyres, fuel, brakes, hardware and software contribute another £8 million. All in all, McLaren have an annual budget of around £220 million. But as we all know, Formula One is super expensive. A world champion driver will cost you £12 million a year, and then there's the 600 race employees to fund. This is their bottom line. McLaren's last published annual profits were just £4.9 million, and it's estimated that they only have £2.5 million in the bank. So how will they pay the £15 million fine? Ron Dennis insists it will not be funded from the race team budget, but from other revenue streams. Indeed, the race team budgets for next year have already been set. So while for McLaren, exclusion from the Constructors' Championship has broken their heart, at least it won't break the bank. One further implication for McLaren next season, they're going to be operating from a garage much further down the pit lane. I'm with Andy Stevens, the, the Spiker team manager. Andy, can you tell us how are the garages allocated and what difference does it make to a team where you are in the pit lane? Um, basically, the garages are allocated on where you finished in the previous year's Constructors' Championship. So uh, the team who scored or were allocated the most um, points in the championship are at the top end of the pit lane and the teams with the least amount are at the bottom end of the pit lane. Um, the biggest implication of this really is the way that the, the space is divided. The top four teams tend to get more garages than, um, than the lower four teams. So for instance this year Renault who are uh, the current Constructors' Championships can sometimes be allocated up to six garages when we will only end up with three. What this means for us is we obviously have a much smaller area to work in which can make the job very difficult and sometimes very dangerous. Thanks Andy. Okay. Well, all this talk of $100 million fines, we have to keep reminding ourselves that this is a sport that we're talking about. And the object is to build a racing car that's better than that of your opponent. And the task for the driver is to get the absolute best out of that racing car. And I suppose in extreme circumstances, try to overtake. Well, Lewis Hamilton here last weekend in Monza demonstrated that in Formula One, overtaking is still possible. Not only that, but it's exhilarating as well. Here's Mark with some analysis. Lewis Hamilton arrived in Formula 1 as GP2 champion. The expectations were high, but he soon delivered. Apart from his confidence, something else stood out, and that was his racecraft, especially his overtaking skills. It's hard to find a driver more self-assured. Hamilton's had some manners put on him by Kubica, but he comes round the outside. He's also gone round Alonso. Stunning start by Lewis Hamilton. Hamilton tucks in behind Raikkonen. Is he going to be brave here? Yes, he is. He takes one Ferrari. Alonso takes the lead. Hamilton's looking at Massa now. He's going round the outside of him. The rookie, the 22-year-old from Stevenage, is having a go, and he's passed him. Hamilton up to second place. That was the Malaysian Grand Prix, but this is Italy last weekend. Lewis Hamilton slow off the line, but he makes amends. Just watch him position himself behind the Ferrari. He squeezes himself over to that left-hand side of the circuit. Places his car with great confidence, one of Lewis's biggest assets. No other driver at this moment in time believes in their car more than him. It's really refreshing to see, and I think it's partly in Lewis's mindset. When he comes up again behind another car, his whole thinking is, bang, getting past straight away and getting on to the next uh, car. Hamilton's move on Kimi Raikkonen's Ferrari at the first chicane at Monza is one of the best I've ever seen. And the Formula One paddock is taking note.
When I saw it, I said, well, there's still a little bit of gap. It cannot be done at this moment. I'm going to do it in the next lap. And at this moment, he just went for it. And I think that's exactly what he just looked in the mirror and they said, well, he's not really next to me now. And just concentrate to the front and suddenly he was next to him. And you could see that Raikkonen was a kind of surprised and it was too late to close the door. I got a good exit from the last corner and I believed that I would be able to slipstream him, but I didn't really catch him on the straight. Um, but I, my personal feeling was when I was in the car and I, I was in the position, I thought, okay, I'm close enough. I've slipstreamed him, I've moved out and I just outbraked him. But I watched the, the onboard footage later and I realised I was maybe two, two car lengths behind. And for me, I, I, I thought it was bloody crazy. But it was good, it was good. I'm glad I pulled it off and, and didn't end up in the barrier or in the grass. And Lewis Hamilton left the McLaren garage a few minutes ago full of expectation, determination and simply glad, I'm sure, to get racing again after this week that's been so full of politics. But what a supreme talent he is. And he sees overtaking opportunities that others can't see at all. How many actually exist around here at Spa? There's a number of overtaking opportunities here on this circuit. That's the beauty of it. It's such a long lap as well. A lot of slips if he goes on. If he's got confidence like we've seen in the last few races, I think you'll see Lewis making a few moves early on in the race. OK, we'll hear more from Lewis Hamilton in just a few minutes' time. Plenty more from Mark as we get closer to the start of this race. But if you've been logging on to the ITV F1 website, it might be you that gets your question answered by now by Mark. This week's question comes from Greg Mahon in the Isle of Man. He asks, how are the wheels tethered to the chassis to prevent them coming off in the event of an accident? Well, we've got the Chief Technical Officer of the Spiker team, Mike Gascoigne. Well, basically, Mark, on each wheel we have a tether. Uh, here's one that we unfortunately put to the test earlier in the weekend when uh, Adrian went off at Turn 7 and hit the wall, but the wheel stayed on. This tether has to withstand a certain load, and we have attachment points both on the chassis and the upright both of which are also tested to withstand a certain load to ensure that we keep the wheels on in an accident. And what's the actual material with that, Mike? This is a Kevlar fibre. It's a load of individual um, uh, fibres bound together. It has to have a certain cross-section area, and also we wrap it up so that it can't suffer any UV damage or um, damage from fluids that we use on the car. And in your expert opinion, this is definitely uh, a good thing for safety. Yeah, and I think you saw the crash with uh, Kimi Raikkonen in, in Monza, which was a very high-speed crash. Hit the wall directly with, without slowing down at all, and all the wheels stayed on the car, which is what we want in Formula One. And for further opportunities to question Mark, log on to the ITV F1 website. It'll also keep you right up to date with all the details on news on the very fast-moving world of Formula One. More from Lewis Hamilton in a few minutes, but the whole of Formula One and the whole of British motorsport has been shocked and saddened by the apparent loss of the former World Rally champion Colin McRae in a helicopter accident yesterday. He had so many close friends in Formula One and many, many admirers, and whatever is happening in and around Formula One at the moment pales into insignificance alongside the seeming loss of one of Britain's greatest motorsport heroes. Formula One back at Spa and the grid is gathering for the Belgian Grand Prix, the last European race of this hugely eventful season. Lewis Hamilton, Britain's world championship leader, he's made it clear that he's no fan of the politics and intrigue in the sport, so he's especially glad that this week is over and he's set to go racing again. But having made a point of attending the Paris hearing on Thursday. Well, for me, it just was important that I went there and to support the team, you know. Um, these guys, I've been with them for since I was 13. And so I very much feel part of the family and, and the feeling that everyone's feeling in the team, I, I feel exactly the same way, you know, very, very emotional for the team. But as you were waiting for the verdict, what was the tension like? Because it was a close run thing where the driver's points were going to be lost or not. It was. And, uh, you know, I got back here, I think it was two, my two o'clock meeting with my engineer. We walk in the track and I had a call um, saying that this is, this is what's been said in the press. And so you can imagine my heart just dropped, you know, to see that... Uh, all the hard work the team have done that I have I've put into this season may have been taken away from me. Unfortunately, I didn't have my points taken away from me, and I think we're really lucky with that. So I'm going to do the best job I can. You know, um, just keep on pushing. It's it's getting tough. 
You have to say there's a bit of pressure on Fernando as well. We saw that pressure in, in, in a press conference a short time ago. He's having to uh, absorb quite a few questions at the moment, isn't he? <laughs> he is. I'm not going to comment again on my opinions about that, but, um, you know, complete shock and surprise. But, um, you know, I just got to go out and beat him. And it sounds easy. It's easier said than done. But, um, you know, in the championship, it's easier to chase than it is to defend. And he is defending the world championship, but he's chasing me. And so, for me, it's, 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 it, the, there's more pressure on my shoulders to keep the spot I have. I've been leading since the, the third round, I believe. And, um, you know, it'll be a shame to, to lose it in the last four. But um, it should be quite an equal getaway for everyone. And um, you've got a tight first corner, which you can overtake. And then you've got a long, long um, drag down to the next turn five. So through a rouge and but there's plenty of room for slipstreaming and overtaking. So, you know, getting from fourth to first is not impossible, although the Ferraris are very quick on the straights. Um, but I always remain optimistic and uh, look forward to the race. Pre-race thoughts of Lewis Hamilton, who will start this Belgian Grand Prix from row two behind an all-Ferrari front row, Kimi Raikkonen and Felipe Massa. Huge crowds here at Spa as Formula One returns to this great circuit, and we'll be down on the grid with Martin Brundle very shortly. But first of all, here's a further chance at our current ITV F1 competition. This weekend, we're giving away a fantastic trip for two to Shanghai for the Chinese Grand Prix on the 7th of October. You'll have return flights and four nights accommodation in an executive room at the Hilton Shanghai. The hotel set in the heart of the city's entertainment center and is within walking distance of the main business and shopping districts. Once you get to the track, you'll also have grandstand seats to watch all the action, an official merchandise bag, plus an exclusive tour of the McLaren Mercedes garage. So to be in with a chance of winning this great prize courtesy of Hilton Racing, here's the question from the world champion. Who was the last driver to win for McLaren? the World Championship, A, Michael Schumacher, B, Jacques Villeneuve, C, Mika Hakkinen. Good luck. Nice one, Fernando. So that question again, who was the last driver to win the World Championship for McLaren? A, Michael Schumacher, B, Jacques Villeneuve, or C, Mika Hakkinen? The number to dial 0901 293 2020 or text F1 plus your answer of A, B or C to 6337. Calls cost a pound per entry from a VT landline. Calls from other networks and mobiles may be higher. Text will also cost a pound plus the standard network rate. You must be 18 or over to enter. Cable and satellite viewers can press the red button and lines close 6pm Tuesday 25th of September. Well Robert, you're a bit further down on the grid than you should have been, aren't you? Yeah, a bit tempo uh, in the end nine positions because of physical changing also the engine. Yeah, well, it's not the best start of the weekend, but let's uh, hope the weekend is not end and uh, let's hope for a good race. How easy is it to get past people here and to make progress up through the field? It's never easy and uh, well, I will try my best. I hope uh, first lap will be, uh, you know, lucky and uh, in the end, first lap is just a bit of luck and. Uh, we see how we develop first corner and after all rush and uh, then let's hope for good pace and some overtaking. Any worries about the first corner? Honestly, I never start so back. So, uh, uh, you know, normally this season I was starting maximum for throw. So we will see. It's always more dangerous in the middle of the pack than in the first three rows. Cheers. Thank you. And as Robert Kubica was saying, Giancarlo Fisichella has also taken an engine penalty. He'll start from the very back row and the race build up in full swing. And I suppose the BMW problems, Mark, uh, suggest that um, Ferrari look even more solid as constructors champions. Now, what sort of satisfaction can they take from getting this title? I think, you know, there's been a great deal of satisfaction because they've worked extremely hard. But whether they're satisfied that it's being done off the back of McLaren being penalised and not being in straightforward competition, uh, I don't know. I have to say, you know, uh, Kubica there is a little far back, but um, he's still going to be a force in the race, and definitely uh, the speed of the BMW is undoubted. Ron Dennis makes his way onto the grid with uh, Lewis Hamilton. What about Felipe Massa's role? He's uh, a wee bit distant in the Drivers' Championship, but alongside Kimi Raikkonen in that all-Ferrari front row, is it going to be more of a support role now from Massa? I think it has to be now. I think they have to lean towards Kimi Raikkonen and try and put a little bit more emphasis behind him. He's got the best chance of trying to pull a championship off for them in the, uh, the Drivers' title. And maybe Massa is a little bit heavier on fuel, and he might just play that supporting role and just keep the McLarens back. But saying that, you know, 
the way the track is around here and the way the, uh, the McLarens are, typically with the aggression of Hamilton, anything can happen, there's plenty of space to overtake. We spotlighted Nico Rosberg in our build-up to qualifying yesterday. Uh, his Williams teammate hasn't qualified quite so well as Rosberg. Rosberg is on row three uh, and Alex Wirtz back on row eight, but we can hear from Alex right now. Well, Alex, it's a long, hard race here. What are the possible complications of a safety car going to be? Um, well, first of all, if safety car means something happened, then uh, we have to see what exactly happened, how long a safety car is going to happen. But uh, if it's a safety car, I think it will screw up some of the people who go on a two-stop strategy. And be good for you. Um, how's your engine doing? It's already had to do Monza. Uh, it had to do Monza. I was moaning a little bit yesterday that, that it was part of uh, my problems. A typical race driver moan, <laughs> so forgive me for that. So let's see how the race develops. I hope everything lasts to the end. As you said, it's a long race and uh, we'll see. Okay. Have a good one, thank you. It's a spa of so many possibilities at the moment, at least. Rain doesn't seem to be one of them, but we can go down to Martin on the grid right now. Welcome to the grid. Heard enough of a Paris court hearings for a while, so have I. Let's see what's going on on the racetrack here. A new wider, improved start, finish straight, as you say, Steve. The weather's looking pretty good up there. Let's see who we can find. Where British uh, crowds up in the grandstands. There are new grandstands on this uh, start-finish line too. Of course, if you want to go to a, a European Grand Prix, this is one you should definitely put on your agenda. It's only two and a half hours across the uh, channel. Here's David Coulthard talking to Christian Horner. Final uh, strategy talk going on. DC, you've been around the track. We've had a few support races this morning. How's the track looking? Yeah, track looks, it's, it's been very consistent and uh, it's look, the, the three days we've been here, inevitably it'll take a few laps to rubber in to put that F1 rubber down again after it's been picked up by the Porsche Silver Cup. Now, uh, a wider uh, start-finish line here and the longer run down of the first corner. Do you have it set in your mind what you're going to do or you just uh, see react as it comes to you? Yeah, well, in the Gamonza, I had very much the, the mindset of attack and obviously I gained a lot of places and then it, uh, it bit me at the, the second lap. Yeah, I'm going to take a slightly more cautious approach because uh, strategy-wise, we're, we're looking for the checker. OK, tragic day for motorsport, of course, with the death of Colin McRae and uh, family members. Sure. Uh, it's, it's shocking, you know. Colin was a friend, as is, as is his lovely wife, Alison, and the, the family. So obviously, my, you know, as is the whole paddock, you know, the, the disbelief here that the McRae's have been affected in this way and obviously and some other family as well. So. Uh, Tragic circumstances. Had to get run over by a Renault. Have a great race. Just uh, a Renault here coming through. So, what's that all about? There must be Fizzy Keller's car that's been uh, been taken from the back of the grid. He'll be starting in the spare car from the uh, from the end of the pit lane. I want to have a word with Heike Kovalainen and if I can find him amongst all these Renault overalls. I don't think I've ever spoken to him on the grid. Is Heike around, Alan? Is he? He's not about. Well, what, what's, what's the story then? You got him here. We think you're the first of the runners on the grid on a one-stopper looking at your grid time. Um, you know, I can't go into that, but uh, we, we're confident with our strategy. We're, we're pretty sure where we know the others are stopping in front of us and I uh, think we're going to have a good race. All right, so at some point then you've got to go, go quite a long way on probably non-optimal tyres and you can manage that, can you? Yeah, the tyres aren't too bad, actually, to be honest. We did long runs on uh, Friday. We're happy with it. All right, well, good luck. What's happened to Fizzy's car? Why are they nearly uh, running us over? He's going in the T car from the pit lane. Why is that? Um, because of his 10 second penalty. Means we can just do a few more things. Take the T car, give us a few more options. Okay, thanks for the information. You are seeing the shot. And uh, let's have a word with, uh, and uh, Richard Creek in there, the Toyota team, very close to McRae. And uh, look, there's a, a really tragic feeling here in the paddock because Colin was uh, massively respected. Flavio. Quick word with you. Dramatic week in Formula One, but we're going racing now, thank goodness. My God, finally, no? Yeah, absolutely. What's the story for you? Any, any news for our millions of viewers standing there, waiting there for the race? No, it is. Well, it'll be a fantastic race, you know. Spa is one of the best race in all circuit, and I hope today everybody enjoy the race. All right, so do I. See you later. Right, let's just have a quick word with uh, Nick Heidfeld. We last spoke to him at the Canadian Grand Prix. He's usually got something sensible to talk to us about. Nick, can you give us a quick word? Well, it was that sensible. You certainly can't misunderstand that today, can you? Right, my last chance then, probably Fernando Alonso. Third, 
on the grid. I'm expecting a complete blank down here as well, but we'll give it a try. Why not? As, uh, I'm sorry, sir. I don't know who that was, but he looked quite important. And here we are, down, and uh, Fernando standing here. I just He's talking to Mark Slade, his engineer. Fernando, a sentence for ITV. He's not allowed to talk. That's a very interesting comment. He's not allowed to talk to the press. Well, that's a shame. We'll wander down to the front of the grid, take a poke around this gorgeous Ferrari. Ferrari are uh, dominating the front row of the grid by only tens, of course. They're strapping in Kimi Raikkonen here on pole position. What a work of art. What an absolutely beautiful piece of equipment. What would you give to be driving that in today's Grand Prix? Those are the cars up. The tire, race tyres are on. They know now uh, they're the tyres he's chosen to start. We'll, as soon as they take the covers off, we'll see if he's gone for the soft tyres or the hard tyres. They will be doing two stops on the front of the grid. The McLaren boys think they can stay with Ferrari through this Grand Prix. We're in for a very close foot race at the front. Back to you, Steve. Thanks very much indeed, Martin. What I'll try and do now is grab a quick word with Mark Blundell. Mark, have you got a moment? I think all of that rather demonstrated the tension down there on the grid. Yeah, I think just more and more the uh, the guys, especially at the front of the grid, are just getting a little bit uh, more focused and it's getting towards the end of this season. And definitely for the front runners like Alonso and uh, Raikkonen, they want to focus and concentrate on the job in hand. Now, what about the battle for the title? Uh, not only Kimi Raikkonen involved, but Alonso against Hamilton in particular. Now that the pressure and demands of the Constructors' Championship are out of the way for McLaren, how does that affect the relationship uh, between the two of them as they go for this title? I don't think there's any difference in reality. Uh, Constructors is done, but it's dog-eat-dog -dog as far as the drivers are concerned. Uh, you know, Lewis is there, he's the rookie, he's to be beaten. At the same time, Alonso, double world champion, wants that third title. And I think it's going to be a great contest today. And I think, you know, this will be maybe a turning point now. If, if Lewis comes away from here stronger again, I think that's how the season will pan out. But if Alonso has a, a stunning result, I can just see Lewis getting it slipping away. And, and that's going to be a lot of pressure to contend with. And what does this first corner hold? It can hold a lot of problems for the drivers. Uh, Lewis there just contemplate what it will be like going into turn one. He's not on the front row, second row. Got to try and achieve something very quickly. He's the man who can do that sort of thing. But uh, turn one here always has fireworks attached to it. So the first of four races that will decide the drivers' championship and Thursday's decision to leave the McLaren drivers' points total intact in the wake of the spying scandal. Well, it had its critics, but we're fans of it right now because it means that one of the best contests for the drivers' title in years can resume right here in Spa. I mean, great tension on the grid down there, etched in the face of Ron Dennis, the Belgian Grand Prix is a few minutes away.